Tonight our guest is John Inglis. He's the Blair class of 93. He was a prefect in Mason. He was a four-year wrestler. Uh, he claims that he was the worst four-year wrestler ever. <laughs> and he was also a very serious student, uh, a Paul White prize winner, senior history prize. He went on to Yale University and then Cornell Law School. He worked for nine years in the private sector and then eventually found his way to the Department of Justice and he is now working in the Immigration Department as an attorney on any number of issues. Um, John had his first formal dinner in 25 years, as he said, which is great. And I think, note that the family, uh, Charles, class of 88, and his wife, and the father, the patriarch of this family, there were four Inkless kids here, is David Inkless, who's in the audience tonight, a great supporter of Blair, and a great guy who was known throughout uh, the student body as Doc Quality because he was a quality guy. So there, thank you. Dan. So I give you one of his offspring, John Inglis. Okay, well thank you all very much. Um, it's a, it's a thrill to be back here at Blair, and it's a thrill to be uh, speaking at Skeptics. I uh, first came to Blair as a freshman in the fall of 1989, um, which is um, I feel the gray hairs you know, screaming at me when I say that. It's been a while. Um, and I attended quite a few Skeptics, and uh, it's, it, I, I love being back here, and thank you, Mr. Miller, and thank you to the Blair community for having me. Um, and uh, as I said, my father, my brother, my are here. My sisters uh, graduated from here too. Um, so there's quite a few um, skeptics that we've attended um, as far as I. Um, as Mr. Moore said, I worked in the private sector in uh, northern New Jersey and New York City law firms for about seven years um, doing commercial corporate litigation. And um, it's fun, it's interesting, did a lot of document review, um, worked on a couple of multi billion dollar um, accounting fraud cases. And I came to this conclusion that, first off, uh, I'm not getting anywhere close to a courtroom in a speaking capacity, and I'm not really working on anything that really drives me. Um, at that time, in the post-9-11, immediate after the post-9-11 era, um, immigration became a hot button issue. You know, of the, um, the 20 hijackers, 19 hijackers on 9-11, most of them were known to the former um, INS. And uh, so we were hired. Um, I work for the United States Department of Justice, the Civil Division. Uh, what we do is civil, not criminal. We're not throwing people in jail. Um, we're, we do remove some people from the country. We work on immigration issues, but we are not putting people in jail. And I work for the Office of Immigration Litigation. There's two major sides of our office. Um, one side, which about three quarters of the people in our office uh, work with asylum and refugee law. Um, and that's the case that I'm going to mention here tonight. Um, and basically, asylum and refugee law, we're dealing with people who are displaced out of their country, and we're trying to figure out whether or not they have a valid basis to stay in our country. Um, so we use applies for asylum. There's basically a four step process. They can have a non confrontational. Um, Asylum interview with an uh, asylum officer. If they um, prove their, their, their merits of their claim, they're granted asylum. Then it gets appealed from there to an immigration judge, the Board of Immigration Appeals, and sort of the last step uh, is an appeal to the United States Courts of Appeals, which is the level below the Supreme Court. And that's where our office comes in. We handle all that litigation um, all across the country. Um, so some good fun travel to California and New York and stuff like that. Um, and the other half of our office handles uh, a smorgasbord of immigration-related matters um, in trial courts across the country. 
or the programmatic challenge. Uh, we see it a lot right now. I'm not going to discuss these specific cases, but challenges to the executive orders um, from the president. Um, we handle denaturalization cases where someone has gained their naturalization through um, fraud. And um, uh, habeas, where people are challenging the legality of their um, detention. I want to talk about a couple broad concepts and a couple um, perceptions that I think people have about the immigration system. Last year, 20, or about a year and a half ago, 2015, uh, was the start of the presidential election. Um, and I think if you watch the debates, uh, there was about 17 candidates on one side, about five or so on the other, and if you didn't pay attention to which side you were watching, just sort of turned up the volume and more actually, you know, looking at the images on the screen, there was one issue where everybody was almost unmistakable, or you couldn't mistake one for the other, and that was immigration. You ask anybody what they want to say about it, and they all say one thing, the system's broken. Well, working in that system, I will tell you something, it's not broken, it's not fixed, um, we had a lot of good stuff done. I want to take a look at that number on the screen. Does anybody have a sense of what that number is? Besides Mr. Miller, I told you. <laughs> that is the number in 2015 of the people in the United States who were granted citizenship who were born outside this country. And I would posit that every single one of those 730,259 people would tell you that the immigration system in this country is not completely broken. Um, one of the big things we hear is that the immigration system is racist, or it is uh, geared towards whites, geared towards Europeans. Of that number, only 101,000 were born in Europe, which means the vast majority of people who are gaining citizenship and are immigrating to our country are born um, in Asia, uh, Central, Latin America, um, and other parts of Africa. Uh, and then the other issue people talk about when they want to say that the system is broken is the, the mythological number that there's 11 million people in this country here illegal. legal. Um, that's a number that no one can really verify uh, precisely. In 2015, there was over 330,000 uh, removals, deportations. So I would once again say that this is not broken. If you want to say that we need to fix it, um, that's really where the debate should be. What is immigration? To me, when I think of immigration, when we talk about what immigration is and what it should be, it's an ordered method of letting people into the country. It's sort of a, a means of categorizing people. And you think about the different ways we need to categorize for immigration, whether it's by the benefit, um, someone's looking for a visa for work, tourism, immigration, um, where they're from. We categorize based, um, uh, based on the country and the, and the region. Um, and also a little bit on, the, on their security risk. And we try to figure out who we should let into this country, who is going to be dangerous for our country, and who um, can we let in safe. What should be our goals? Um, a lot of these goals uh, can be in conflict with each other. One of the major goals that we need to work on, we need to prioritize is economic. Um, in 2015, we let in over 65 million um, tourists. Those are people who are coming into our country, um, visiting our sites, visiting our cities, spending money, um, enriching our country, and then, by and large, actually leaving. Um, and then we have workers. You know, ever, one of the big issues right now is um, whether we should have foreign workers coming into our country. Uh, once again, we break it down. We try to make sure that we're uh, who's coming in, what level. So, we, from the workers, uh, you have elite uh, visas. You have elite um, elite level of, uh, visa for people like Hebrew. Or if you look at the NHL, the NBA, athletes, people who are selling out, you know, uh, stadiums across the country. Um, who else needs uh, foreign workers? Apple, Google. Facebook, um, H-1B visas, there's a tremendous um, uh, desire for um, more skilled uh, engineers. Um, beyond economic, we, we deal with security issues um, on a non-stop basis. 
uh, who do we let in? Who, do we, who are we confident uh, can come into our country and um, respect our laws and not provide a security challenge? Um, what if a foreign government is hostile to us? Are its people? Um, how can we tell who is um, going to be a security problem? And then we have, I think, one of the biggest issues, and that's one I'm going to talk about today, and that's uh, social obligation, um, altruism, refugees. How many refugees should we let into our country? Um, and what's the basis for this? You know, why should we let someone in as a refugee? Um, so, I would like to talk about uh, one test case. This is a case that I tried a few years ago. Um, I'm going to change um, the name of the country, the name of the, uh, the immigrant, but I kind of want to work through a one case and sort of get your opinions. And if anyone has a question or comment as we're going through this, please feel free to raise your hand um, and let me know your thoughts. Um, and before I get to the, um, the specific case, I just want to go through a couple just. Preliminary concepts. Um, asylum, which is an official legal status in our country, uh, is available to refugees as they are defined by Congress. The Congress says a refugee is a person outside the country of nationality who is unable or unwilling to return to that country, quote, because of persecution, meaning that they were persecuted in the past, or a well-founded fear of persecution on account of just five reasons, race, religion, nationality, particular membership in a particular social group, which is sort of a, a little bit of a catch-all, or political opinion. But if you can't fit into one of those five, um, asylum is not available. Um, as I said, asylum is a recognized legal status in this country. Um, someone who has asylum after a year can apply for permanent residence. They get their green card. Um, and basically, once you get asylum, in most instances, you will have the right to live in this country for the remainder of your life um, and um, naturalize at some certain point going forward. Okay. So in this case that I want to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about um, a person named Howard, uh, who's native of a war-torn country in Western Africa. Howard grew up in a peaceful town the son of a politically active father. Uh, he lived a happy childhood, doing many of the things that most of us would do as kids, going to school, um, uh, you know, play sports with his friends, living with his family. Um, but the, the country's poor, and it had a military uh, dictatorship for you know around 30 years. But even though there's a dictator, his town was peaceful. There's no violence for most of the time that he was a child. Uh, things start to change when he's in middle, middle school. His father's poisoned, um, but we don't know why. Uh, was it because of his politics? There's speculation, but in a military state um, or dictatorship, uh, it's uncertain. It's hard to know. Uh, if someone is persecuted or, or poisoned for being critical of the government, uh, there's not always a strenuous government uh, investigation. In 1985, Howard goes to college. Uh, he joins the campus version of what's called the National Opposition Group, or the MOMO, uh, in that country. He becomes a foreign affairs liaison uh, for the student body, which means that he's organizing student events with international students, international um, schools. Um, but as he's telling us this um, story, we, we have no evidence, or no witnesses. He's the sole witness. Basically, our whole determination is based on his um, testimony. In 1987, he leads a protest against higher university fees. Um, and the students uh, led the, alleged that the university uh, has made a corruption. That's a big deal, because the university is part of the government, so by alleging corruption against the university, you're alleging corruption against the government as a whole. Um, and then the protests start to grow and grow and grow, and then they start exceeding the scope of the, the university. 
Then in 1987, everything blows up. Um, and there's major unrest nationally. And we know that because not just beyond what he tells us, but we have a bunch of reports from the Department of State and various other sources that we can look at that will tell us what a country condition is in quite a few countries around the world. Uh, in response, the government declared martial law, uh, and there's a national crackdown, and that goes across many universities, including the one where Howard is a student. Um, the claim is that um, many students are arrested, beaten, and even few are killed. Uh, so what does Howard do? He goes into hiding. So he claims he's fearful because the reports are that three of the 14 major um, leaders of this uh, student group uh, have been jailed. And he is charged with, he claims he was charged with uh, treason for leading these protests. There's another issue in, this, in, in, this, in the country where he's from. It's a tribal issue. Back in 1994, um, perhaps some of you have learned in school or uh, here of the, uh, the issues in Rwanda. You have the, the Hutu and the Tutsis uh, who were fighting. And what you had there was you had a privileged um, tribe uh, that was privileged during the days of colonialism, and then you have uh, a secondary tribe uh, and that had then uh, sort of risen back into power. Um, and you have a backlash. Um, and that's what was going on here with the claim. Uh, Howard claims his uh, tribe was more harshly punished and that they were being increasingly discriminated against in his home country. Um, and basically what we see is a downward trajectory in the country. Howard tries to flee and he's detained by the police on the border. Uh, he's detained uh, for 11 days in an informal prison on the border, in the bathroom facilities. Uh, he's only fed one small cup of broth a day. Uh, and he's not given a bed. He sleeps on the floor. Um, so basically pretty bad conditions. And then he claims he's beaten, beaten with a, with a baton. Um, but there's no scars, there's no proof of injury, and there's never any um, allegation or uh, claim that he visited a medical facility or a doctor. And finally, he claims that while he was detained, uh, one of the officers said, um, very generically, we do not like people like you. Uh, there's no witnesses to this, um, so there's no explanation as to what like you means. What could it mean? We do not like people like you could mean we don't like student protesters, meaning they don't like him because of number five, his political opinion. We don't like you, means they might not like him because of his tribe which would be number four, number three, excuse me. Um, but also it could be we don't like people who are leaving the country, or people who are detained. I mean, it's a little bit of a generic statement. Uh, Howard is able to escape on the 12th night, and uh, he's able to then flee the country. He then comes to the United States in 1988 on uh, a tourist um, as though he basically had permission to, to, live, to stay here for three months and return. Uh, he doesn't. He overstays his visa, which is not an uncommon problem. And in 2002, 14 years later, <coughs> he files his asylum application uh, based on his political activities. So I think the interesting thing for me as an immigration attorney, having argued the appeal, written the, the appellate brief on this and argued the appeal, um, is applying the law to the, uh, the evidence here. And I think that we, we, the first question to ask is, uh, if we look what happened to Howard, does the level of harm here rise to the level of persecution? Um, and we look for what he said. He was detained, he wasn't fed, he was, um, he was beaten, and uh, three of the 14 people in his um, political party were detained. Does that sound like persecution? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad to have someone at least nod in their head. Yeah, that's, that, on, on the grand scheme of things, that, that, that's pretty significant. Um, especially when you also look and you see that people have allegedly been killed. So if we t 
take him, um, what he told us on the space, I think that that's persecution. Um, what about the fear of future persecution? Does he have a well-founded fear of future persecution? Well, if you have a past, there's a presumption of future. Um, how would that change? Uh, I had a case in uh, around the same time where we had someone claiming that he was fearful of persecution in Poland because he was a member of Solidarity in 1980. Well, he probably was persecuted. I'm assuming what he said was truthful. You know what the problem is? Uh, the communist government in Poland fell in 1989. So even if he had been, would have been persecuted in 1988, things have changed pretty substantially since then. And he couldn't make out a, an asylum claim anymore because there really was no well-founded fear. In this case, I will say this. Our knowledge of this country um, was, was probably not on the same level of, of Poland. And the fact that he can make out past persecution would suffice, suffice for a future. Um, what about the next one? Nexus to a protected ground. Do we think that he's established persecution on one of these five grounds? Why do you say that? Like you said, he uh, was persecuted for his political opinion while membership in a social group. But how do you, I mean, yeah. I, I, I think that that's right. I think that the question always is, is you don't know exactly why. You know, we don't know if they just don't want people fleeing the country or what have you, but I think in this case, um, considering sort of the proximity of when student <laughs> protests took place and when he was actually arrested, um, it becomes pretty clear that they are persecuting him based on his political opinion. Um, these decisions ultimately are usually made um, by the immigration judge or you know, we have some prosecutorial discretion. If we take this to court, it's, it's the judge who makes the determination. This, um, the one I'm mentioning, I think is a little bit more of a stack in favor of uh, the, the applicant than some. Um, but, you know, I think that it gives a good feel for it. Um, what's the next? Okay. So this is, I should have said this once again. The applicant bears the burden of proof of proving eligibility for asylum based on specific facts and credible testimony. So I think this is one of the hardest issues that we have to deal with, is how do you prove by specific facts and credible testimony that you were persecuted when you're fleeing the country? And if you think about this, if someone's chasing you, uh, or you feel like you need to flee, Take his story on its face. He's, if three of the 14 student leaders are facing persecution, is he going to stop and try to gather evidence? Is he going to get an affidavit from someone saying, yes, we want to arrest you? Um, or gather any kind of you know, newspaper articles or any kind of evidence like that? I think the answer is no. And that's what makes it difficult. Um, so this interesting case. Um, anyone want to guess how it turns out? Is there, Say asylum? Is there, is there a record of like, his arrest? No, there's no record. We don't have it. There's, so there's really no proof at all. Like, there's, like, you can't just take his word for it. Okay. Do you have any criminal record while he's in the States? No criminal record in the United States. He was here for a while, too. Although, whether or not he was persecuted there, um, that's you know sort of a separate issue. Um, the thing is also, is, you know, you have to think about this. If you're detained in an informal prison by security guards in a um, you know in a poor country, would there be that prison record from the from the border, especially in a, you know a place where you're not feeding people, you're leaving them to sleep on the floor? So you know, I think it's 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 a, it's a good question. It's a good point to raise. But it's not always something that would, you know, that evidence might not actually ever be present. Um, so let me tell you how this case came to our attention. This guy, Howard, um, after he was here for about 15 years, marries a United States citizen. Um, he gets his green card. 
Um, and then you apply for naturalization. And you maybe shouldn't apply for naturalization, because sometimes when you're flying below the radar, um, this is not my legal advice for someone not giving this, it's the of the United States Department of Justice. Um, leave, leave well enough alone. Um, because he applies for um, citizenship based on his marriage. Well, if you're applying for citizenship based on marriage, what's the number one thing you should have? A bona fide marriage. You should actually be married to that person. It's one thing to walk down an aisle, um, stand before a priest, rabbi, minister of the peace, and recite vows. It's another thing to actually then live in a married life. Uh, in this case, there was a finding that there was not a bona fide marriage. Um, they were both interviewed separately. I asked Howard, where in Virginia do you live? Alexander. I asked his wife, where do you live? Norfolk. They're not right next to each other. It's about two and a half hours apart. It's not, it's not an easy mistake to make. Um, they, asked, they asked, I can't remember which one. They asked one of them, have you ever been separated? Yes, for two months. The other one, have you ever been separated? No. Once again, not an easy thing to get wrong. Um, and then it gets worse. They start looking at it, they start looking at her family. She has kids, he doesn't. She had kids in their marriage from somebody else. Um, and they both had different mailing addresses for an extended period of time. Now, I'll tell you something, that's not a disqualifier for asylum. So he lied about his marriage. But what that does do is that which is after the fact. So whether or not he has got a, a fear of persecution, you know, the fact that he, he lied about his marriage, that's different. But we look then at his evidence a little closer. And I think one of you asked about the, um, the, the arrests. Well, we don't have any evidence of the arrest. Um, but we also don't have records showing he's one of the student leaders. Um, there are newspaper reports that mention some of the student leaders, and he's not one of them. Now, maybe he was omitted for some reason, uh, but then we look further and there's no witnesses, there's no evidence, there's nothing. So we basically have someone who um, alleged a lot of specific facts, but didn't give us credible testimony. And so he was denied asylum. And we won this case on appeal. It was a nice way. Was he approving the assignment? Yeah, but was he even proven to be the son of this uh, dictator you mentioned before? Not son of the dictator, sorry. He was son of someone who opposed the dictator. I mean, it was, uh, like, is that proof as well, or is that in the air as well? So I got to say, a lot of times in these situations, you know, when you have, you think about some of the war torn countries and some of the, the, the countries in this world that are politically unstable, getting proof from them is extraordinarily difficult. Um, Getting proof in this country can be difficult, but going over there, um, especially you know, when a lot of these people do not, do not have a right to counsel, um, do not have you know, very many financial uh, means, uh, it, that's a hard thing to prove. So no, he was not proven, he couldn't prove that. Um, I will say a lot of times, for asylum law, if someone has credible testimony, um, and there is nothing that goes against it. You know, there's, there's no evidence, there's no um, lack of credibility. Um, the requirement for the physical proof, the physical evidence, is, is a little diminished. John, um, you said you won this case on appeal. Can you explain to everybody about why you had to win the case on appeal and how that whole thing worked? Sure. So this case was tried before an immigration judge. Um, an immigration judge is technically it's a judge within the Department of Justice, um, and uh, there is a small trial for the immigration judge. Uh, he represents himself, and then there was an, department, an attorney for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, after they have that trial before the department, before this immigration judge. He has an appeal, an automatic appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then he can appeal to the United States Courts of Appeals. And that's where my office comes in, is to handle this last layer of appeals. So, yes, I'm sorry. So the first judge said no, and then he appealed? Correct. And then? Yes, so if yeah. he had won in front of the first judge, this case would have been over. 
um, he would have had asylum. If he won in front of the Board of Immigration Appeals, he would have won, he would have had asylum. Um, I will say that um, my numbers on this are a little uh, dated, but by the time they get to our office, 50 to 60 percent of the asylum claims have been decided in the applicant's favor. So when it gets to our office, we have about an 85, 90 percent winning percentage. Some, you know, you can say, well, that's very impressive, but the meritorious case is long decided. Or larger. Yes? Was he ultimately uh, deported, or did he have to keep his green card? No, he lost his green card. Um, you know, the process after you have, um, after, after we win, he has a, a, administra a final order of removal from this country. The problem then is actually getting the person out of the country. Um, there are certain countries that we have very good relations with um, that will readily take somebody back. Um, Mexico, a lot of European countries, it, 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 it's, rel it's relatively easy. There are a lot of countries that will not take um, people back. And so then you have an order of removal against somebody, but what are you going to do with them? Um, because you, know, you just can't go and drop them in that country. So I actually admit, I do not know what ended up happening to him, whether or not they were able to execute that order of removal. Yeah. But so after all this and after he lived more than a decade in these countries, his green card was taken away from him because he was a threat to the country? Or why, why was he, he got there? his green card originally. So he came over here as a Turks. Mm -hmm. um, supposed to stay here, um, my presumption not having you know, seen that part of the evidence in quite a while, was for three months. He stays 14 years. And then he starts to ask, you know, apply for a green card, based on his marriage to a United States citizen, which is fraudulent. So the reason he got the green card was, was a fraud. Oh. So that was taken away when they determined that his marriage was fraudulent. Yeah. No, if his marriage had been determined to be legitimate, would his asylum application have mattered at all, or he would just become a, he would become a citizen? He would get become a citizen. So that's what that wouldn't matter. Yeah. Um, but then we, we execute or issue an order of removal and perhaps know that that order can't be carried out. That's correct. So he remains in the country, perhaps, with an order of removal. So right? that's why people might think the system is broken. Well, no, look, and I, this, my only point is that if you look at a system, immigration system in this country, that involves the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, um, I deal regularly with state, I deal with you know, health and human services, Department of Labor, it's enormous. You know, you're dealing with tens and tens of million people moving through this country who have um, you know, um, work authorizations, and there's problems. You know, so a lot is fixed, there's parts that are broken. But one of the problems is, is that if we do not have, if we're not on friendly terms with the country, or if we think that someone is going to be tortured if they go back to their country of origin, you know, yeah, we, we can't remove them. But what happens then if, um, say hypothetically 10 years down the road, this country becomes peaceful? Or we get on better terms with them? If, if you look at the United States, there's countries now that we were friends with that we were not friends with 20 years ago, and vice versa. So if we have that outstanding order of removal, then we can execute it on a, a later date. And that also limits his ability then to naturalize or get any other kind of immigration benefits. So this guy, and I said, I, I don't know sort of where he stands now, um, and I don't like sort of inquiring, it's not really my business. I did my part of this case. Um, you know, he, he, can't, he can't bring anybody over. So his, his options here are more limited. Yes? Uh, let's say he was supposed to go back to a country that we don't have a relationship with, where that country will take him. We sometimes look for other countries that we have, that we are allies or have to, that would possibly grant him asylum. And you could we say, theoretically, let's say Canada says that we can take the grants and asylum. Is the judge, is your department, uh, or the department that you, you know, give this case to, look to see if there are other countries where he can get asylum in? There are, I mean, there are situations where that happens. That's limited. Um, you know, I think you see that in some high profile cases. 
um, we saw that in some of the, the Guantanamo cases where um, you know we couldn't figure out you know we didn't want to continue charges but we didn't want that person out in this country and then there were sometimes were third country havens that came along and accepted some of those people but that's that's not common I mean, Canada has Canada has done immigration issues they have people um, you know that, that they're in on land so they're not coming here offering yeah uh, but I also say one other thing of interest um, United States citizens get, get moved from um, countries internationally also one of the cases I was working on um, extensively over the last two years was a United States citizen who got deported from the Philippines um, when they found that he didn't have a valid US passport and had broken some laws here they weren't so excited about letting him stay there and then he sues the United States government and then I have to go defend it um, you know, he was not a good guy this guy is a liar not necessarily a bad person that guy was a bad person I'd be interested to hear how many students feel that this fellow living here, presumably not a criminal for 14 years, should be allowed to stay, even though he broke the <coughs> law with a fraudulent marriage plan. Uh, I'd love to hear from other people. What do you think? Tim, no? I just think there are certain situations, um, and like you briefly mentioned, the mythical number of illegal immigrants that are here right now that you know, there was an argument, I guess, during mostly during the presidential election about should all of these people be deported or, you know, given a path to citizenship. It's a little, like, I think it gets a little bit difficult when you get to the point where, like, some of those people have been here 20 plus years and have created a life here. And right. They're sending back to a country that maybe they no longer have any relationship with anyone there. And, Right. Well, I've a life so. I know. I'm trying not to get too much into politics, but I'll sort of talk about the state of the law. Um, uh, about four or five years ago, um, while well, President Obama was president, um, they went in there with um, prosecutorial um, initiatives and said, "Look, if you have 11 million people who are here in this country illegally." And we have, you know, DHS and Department of Justice that are um, dealing with deportation removal cases. Let's go after the criminals and let's prioritize the criminals. And you know, uh, not to, to try to analyze it uh, or to evaluate it. Just, I think what what you see a lot of what the new administration is doing is the same thing. Of they're sort of couching in different terms. I won't say it's identical, but let's go after the criminal aliens. Uh, the people who are here who have, um, you know, sometimes the crimes are severe, sometimes they're not, but let's go after them as opposed to, as a priority, as opposed to people who are living peacefully here for us. Could there have been a narrative for this guy? that he was persecuted, and he came here, and he stayed, and he was afraid. And then because of uncertain immigration issues, you know, like the climate towards immigrants was getting testier. So he figured, I've got to do something. I have no evidence of the persecution. So right. let me try and come up with something. Come here, will you marry me, and we'll do, you know, whatever. I mean, how, how, I mean, sometimes, as you said, you just don't have evidence. And right. people can, out of fear, try and do things that maybe they shouldn't do, or they certainly shouldn't do, but, you know, I mean, it, it's tough. I mean, you could easily have a narrative where this guy deserved asylum and would be in danger if he went back to his, other, to his country. So the marriage fraud isn't the preclusion. The marriage fraud is the reason, the, the reason why we're precluded from getting uh, asylum. The marriage fraud, this is probably why we took a much closer look at this case than we might have otherwise. Because if you looked at this case and you just looked at his testimony, you know, I read the transcripts. At first blush, yeah, it seems reasonable. You know, he was living in, a, in an unstable country where some of this stuff did happen, you know, but there's just no proof that it happened to him. But then when you, when you see that this, you know, he's, he's lied and so many other 
um, ways. And I think you, you start looking at this a little more critically and saying, you know, can you prove any of it? And you know, you're saying that you're one of 14 leaders, but we don't see any evidence in the newspapers or anywhere else that you're one of these leaders. You know, where where is where is your credible testimony? But I but I do think that's 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 a valid point. And someone who lies about and I'll say this as a as a when I go to trial, I catch someone in one line, sure. yeah, I'm gonna keep mentioning that to the judge every two minutes, mm -hmm. and sometimes more frequently. But just because you lie one person doesn't always mean that you're you're a liar every yes, Isn't it uh, somewhat remarkable though that the United States entertained his claim of being a, uh, a refugee, even though it took him over almost 15 years to decide to make it. I mean, many times if you sleep on your rights, you don't get a hearing. Can I make a comment before I answer that question? Anybody has five minutes after skeptics today, <laughs> go talk to that gentleman. One of the, uh, the great prosecutors uh, in North Jersey. Uh, he also had the, the great privilege of um, driving me to Blair quite a few times. He was, um, we had a carpool. That's uh, Mr. Bracken. He was, um, he's a good friend and um, he's a great attorney. No, I think that, that that's correct. Um, the fact that the law's changed a little bit since, since this case. Um, if someone comes over today, they have to file their asylum application within a year. And if you don't file your asylum application within a year, um, and unless you can show that there's a changed country condition, um, or you know, a reason why your asylum claim arose after you were here, um, you lose the right to get to apply for asylum. And because we don't want people sleeping on their rights. But yeah, I think that we, we went above and beyond. This person had here in court, an immigration judge, had an administrative level appeal, the Board of Immigration Appeals, and he got his appeal to the Fourth Circuit. And you want to talk about a lot of process, um, making sure that this guy's rights weren't trampled, um, I think he got it. I want to show two more quick slides and then if there's more questions or comments. If we can just go ahead. So I, I showed you the one earlier that said you need to apply for asylum based on um, race, religion, political opinion, nationality, or a particular social group. Um, I guess my question is, is that's what I have to deal with. Because I'm an attorney working for the Department of Justice. Congress writes these laws. It's my job to apply the law that Congress has written. I think it's as students at this school, and people who will maybe, maybe somebody voted last time, but people are going to be voting in the next presidential election, and presidential elections for 40, 50 years to come. What should be the law? Um, and should asylum be open to, to more people than just those five groups? Um, what about economic refugees? Now you want to talk about people who are coming to this country who fear going back to their country of origin. Um, what if they, look at our stat there, 50, the average GDP in this country per capita is 56,000. Now granted some of those people in this country are making a lot less, more, some are making less. But if you look down this, this list, China, um, emerged significantly in the 25 years since I was here, 14,000. El Salvador, we get a lot of um, economic um, migrants from, 8,600. And if you look down at Central African Republic, and I'm nothing against them, I just, did, they, they were at the bottom of the, the list, um, I don't know what the list was, it's a little bit lower there. Um, 628. I mean, what do you think? If, if you're coming into this country from a country like that, were you faced with going back to go, you know, making um, an average of $628 a year? Should that be a reason to apply for asylum? Should that be someone who we should take in if they come to this country? Some people would say yes. I think the problem with that is you're, you're, you're opening a floodgate. And, you know, if you want to have asylum for people who are going to be persecuted, people who are going to be beaten based on an innate quality in them, and then you start opening asylum to economic refugees, you, 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 the amount of, uh, we let it 50,000 now. If, if that's what you do, it's going to drown it out. Um, 
But let's look beyond that. What about crime, general crime? Um, look at homicide rates. It's a good way to measure crime in a, in a relative uh, cross um, country line. Japan's staggeringly low with 0.3 murders per 100,000 people. Um, ours at 3.9. Could and should be a lot lower, but you know what? It's below the global average. But I have friends who live in El Salvador, and I, I know people who've been to Honduras. Um, going back to one of those countries, um, you face a tremendous risk. Um, I know I was doing a lot of litigation in uh, Texas along the Mexican border, um, where opposite were um, Matamoros, Claros, and the way of Laredo. Um, I was told I was actually not allowed to go over there as a member of the Department of Justice because um, one of the cartels had a bounty on our head, um, which immediately took any desire I might have had to go over there. Um, not a fan of bounties on my head. But should that be, should that be a basis for, for asylum? If someone comes here from Honduras and says, uh, you know, that's 25, our, our murder rate is 25 times what it is in the United States. I fear, I fear that there's a good chance I'll be murdered back home. Should we, should we expand? And I think that that, that is a common question. You know, there's, we had a lot of people coming to the United States from various countries. Um, El Salvador and Honduras are, are up there. There's a lot of, um, you know, when we talk about people coming across the Mexican border, it's Mexicans, but it's also a lot of people from these countries. And these are issues I think that we need to, as a country, think about. Yes? You just mentioned your experience on the Mexican border. Uh, what are your thoughts on the border wall? Uh, based on it's just like it's a lot of potential cost um, and how effective it really will be, given the fact that people cross the border not just Mexico, but as mentioned, they from Central America as well. So, I'm, I'm not a big fan of um, commenting on my boss, and you know, <laughs> either way, you know, but this is a big issue. This is what's going to be taking up a lot of the news over the course of the next couple of years. Um, there's a fence in a lot of it. I do a lot of work in Brownsville, which is where Mexico hits the United States, hits the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I've done a lot of work in San Diego for the polar sides of the Mexican border. Um, they both have a fence. Um, there's a fence over um, large portions of California, New Mexico, Arizona. And I think from a construction standpoint, doing Texas is going to be hard, and then you also have a, you have some tough issues, tough issues uh, that we're already dealing with in terms of you know, eminent domain. That if someone lives on the border and they have their house all on the border, you know, we're just going to, you know, can you go and just um, take over their house and then build a fence there? Um, these are issues that are litigated currently. And they have been litigated. So we have been building a fence. Um, you know, it's. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I will say this, a lot of the people, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. That's, you know, leave that, leave that to politicians, leave that to everyone to vote. I'm not saying to do it, you know, either way. Um, but a lot of people who are here illegally, if you look at that 11 million, and you look at the people who are adding to that number, uh, a lot of them are visa overstates. People who are coming with, um, you know, maybe a temporary work permit. People who are here, for travel, don't do what they're supposed to. So, yes? You started off by saying our system is not broken and it's not fixed. Is there any country that you've worked with that you think has it right, that has the right balance of the rule of law, but also some of the compassion that you've started to talk about? I think it's hard. I mean, I've definitely attended lectures where we've, we've had people from Canada speak, we've had people from European countries speak. I think yeah, so many countries are differently situated, and they have different, you know, desires and different, um, um, you know, different issues, security issues they're dealing with. Uh, Canada, you know, has, uh, I, I, my understanding has had over the course of the, the last 20 years a desire to grow much more than we have. So they wanted to take in more immigrants than we have. Um, Europe is having a very different kind of security issue right now than, than we're dealing with. Um, so, 
you know, I, I think that countries do look at each other's systems and they try to figure out, you know, is there something we're doing with asylum, is there something that someone else is doing with asylum? But, you know, I don't know if there's a country that's really on par with the United States where we can say, you know, we're kind of similar enough to them that we can say that they've got it right and we don't. I don't know if that's... I mean, I just come to mind Australia, which is often held up as a good role model in terms of how they have balanced their needs as a country and immigration mm -hmm. flows and how they've vetted people and so forth. But I think Australia's having trouble. A, Australia's different. I mean, they're, they're an island. I mean, they don't, it's, it's harder to get there. Uh, they don't have, um, but I think they have a lot of criticism about what's going on there too now. And I think that, you know, they have a lot of, I don't know, I, I will say this, I'm not an expert on Australian immigration, but I do know um, that they have a lot of, they've been putting a lot of refugees on other islands and sort of, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't give you enough answer, but I do. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, Syrian refugees are a big uh, issue at this point, and I was wondering about the five criteria they have to fit into one of those. If you're just uh, an innocent civilian living in Syria and you flee for fear of being caught in the crossfire, do you fall into any one of those five categories? I mean, I think if you were the attorney working for them, you probably could come up with um, a <laughs> pretty good argument. Uh, I mean, I think religion is, is, is a big one. Um, I think a lot of them, a lot of the bombing is. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I think. Based on Syria, yes, I think you can make like a, um, a religion issue, um, but I, or that it's a different group, that, you know, they're, you're being persecuted based on your um, proximity to um, the, the opposition forces. But I will say this, in general, um, just saying you're an innocent civilian in a war-torn country does not fit into one of those five. And that's, that's a big issue. You know, once again, I put up here the, you know, the general crime, the general poor economic condition. You know, if, if you're getting caught in the crossfire of a generic civil war, should that be one of the, um, the ground? Once again, um, I, I think that it's legitimate, you could say it's legitimate, in the sense these people are being killed, and they're unable or unwilling to return home. Are you opening up the, um, the floodgates? Um, on the topic of uh, illegal, immigrant, illegal immigrants that pay taxes, there's a lot of legal immigrants that pay taxes through ITIN numbers. Like, what is your, um, what is, what do you think about that in relation to like whether they're allowed to adjust their status? Like, if there's a double standard to that. You? I just wanted to see, like, as a point of defense attorney who works yeah. for the department, like, what, what is your stance on that? Do you think there should be something, like, that there should be, it should be recognized as a, as a even though they are illegal with immigrants, that they do pay taxes? Look, I think that that's definitely something that, um, <laughs> the, um, I mean, there are a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to think, someone asked you a question yet, you know, um, I haven't specifically thought about, but yeah, I think if you are paying your taxes, like, there is a merit there, um, but then again, you know, uh, you know, is that person otherwise removable or they're otherwise here illegal and what are the other conditions that, that, that are brought them here? Um, so, you know, if that person is a criminal and they've committed an actual crime beyond just that they're here illegally, well, I don't think that helps you too much. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, as I said, I think that uh, the previous administration was focusing pretty significantly on uh, the removal of criminal aliens, and I do think that's what it looks like the current administration is going to do too. But so I think someone in that situation does have a leg up. Um, if you ran the Justice Department, are there any things that you would like to change? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a tough question because basically what it's asking me is, um, are there any problems with my current leadership? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that what we need to keep always doing is making sure that we're aware of you know, who we're bringing cases against. Um, there are certain cases that, that I personally think are quite important. Um, I do a lot of denaturalization cases um, where we go after, where we uh, affirmatively seek to revoke this to naturalization of people who've committed pretty heinous crimes before they were naturalized. Um, and, um, and that way we can then seek their removal from this country. Uh, when you naturalize, there's an extensive questionnaire you have to fill out. And two of the questions are, have you ever committed a crime uh, that you've been prosecuted for? Have you ever committed a crime you've not been prosecuted for? Uh, basically, is there something behind you know, the curtain that we should be aware of? Um, and uh, when we find people, um, after the fact, who have committed some pretty significant crimes, uh, we are able to go after their denaturalization. And that's the kind of case that I that you know, is very difficult when you're um, dealing with those kind of issues. But yeah, when we're able to denaturalize someone for a major sex crime or something like that, that is something that in the day makes me feel good. And those are the kind of cases that I would love to see us do more of and be more of the yeah. There's been a lot of disagreement about the <laughs> level of vetting that's been done for refugees and things like that. And there are a lot of people who say that the Justice Department has done a really great job of vetting, and that's a big process and a long process and everything else. And there have been others who have claimed that the vetting process has not been detailed enough or whatever. What do you say about, I mean, do you think that at this point, the vetting process up until now has been sufficient? Or are there holes that we need to fill? Well, I think the vetting process is something that um, we get a lot of people and some very short initial um, agencies do a lot of work on. Um, just, you know, a lot of security and stuff like that goes into that. Um, but I think we're doing a pretty decent job. You know, if you look at the, the vast numbers of people that are coming into this country um, and, and look at the amount of crime and the amount of you know, terrorist acts that have taken place in the last 10 to 15 years. I think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, what's, what's the standard? We want to be as perfect as we can be. We want to be better. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the only perfect system is one where you don't let anybody in. So, but I will say that I've worked with some of these people. Um, we have uh, definitely a couple of cases where people have challenged um, their denial of, of, um, of rights, or sorry, of uh, benefits, and naturalization, or their, their adjustment. And um, we, I think we do a pretty good job of trying to figure out if someone's a security concern and um, making the appropriate decision. But I also say this, we have a lot of people who, who um, have a friend who works for the ACLU down in El Paso. Who, um, would have a very different opinion than I do. Um, she would say that we're overly um, restricted and that we should allow a lot more people in. Um, so it, it sort of depends where you are. Um, I, I, you know, wait times don't bother me. I don't mind when I have to wait to get on an airplane. I don't, I don't mind the, the TSC. Um, they want me to take my shoes off. I'll take my shoes off. They want me to, you know, after 9-11, they used to pack people down. I used to get patted down all the time getting on an airplane. Don't bother me. Um, so I, look, I think we're doing a good job, um, and I think we're trying to do an even better job. Yeah. Uh, do your personal politics ever factor into your work? 
Uh, you, you take who you are in the office. Um, but at the end of the day, I work for the Department of Justice, and it's my job to defend the United States. I know people who are big Democrats um, that intend to continue working um, for the Department of Justice over the next three and a half to seven and a half years. Um, I also know people in my office who have done an amazing job um, over the last eight years, and they were they look at their bookshelves and see Rumsfeld's book autobiography, you see Bush's you know biography. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you are who you are. You know, there's a case that based on who I am as a person, I don't think I could work on. I'd go into my boss's office and I would tell him for reason X, Y, and Z. I, I would like to be taken off this case. Um, but, you know, I, I also think that, you know, as administrations change, if you look at the civil service, um, you know, it, it's important to try to find a way to keep working for the new administration and stay loyal to um, your cause. Okay. I was just going to ask, is, is technology changing the Department of Justice's ability to do its job, or is it is it having a positive impact, or is it making things more confiscated? No, it makes things easier. Um, I have a case where we have um, 12,000 documents, and um, if I want to find out if you know, one word appears in any of those 12,000 documents, I can find out in uh, 30 seconds. It probably takes two minutes. I need to have my paralegal come in and teach me how to do it. <laughs> and sign me. But you know, we can figure it out. Um, so your ability to, to sift through just, you know, vast numbers of documents, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of documents. Um, so let's tell them, uh, Mr. Miller, before we started, um, I've argued a lot of appeals, um, you know, about 20, 25 appeals. And on a public court, you have three judges. Um, and I've had quite a few where you have one judge present, two judge present, and then the third judge is a TV screen. Um, and the judge, for whatever reason, can't make it to the courthouse, and you're sitting there arguing in front of a TV screen. And I gotta tell you, in the heat of the moment, when you're, when you're arguing, it doesn't really matter, you know, and so that makes it a lot easier. Or I had to do a deposition down in Juarez, at a, in Juarez, Mexico, which um, is getting better. Um, for a while, it was, it was crime ridden. And, um, and, you know, the murder rate was, you know, akin to what we see on this, on, on this uh, slide. And um, I didn't want to go down there. We, we couldn't get permission to let the people who we were deposing come out to the United States. And so we did a video link deposition. So, you know, I would say it was about 98% as effective as being in the same room. It's still nice to sort of be in front of somebody. But technology is pretty amazing. What you can do with it. John, we're way up to eight now. Oh, okay. We're going to end it, but if you'd like to speak a little bit, come up front.